Good morning and welcome to the Bristol Better You today. I'm so glad you're joining me here today. And um, we are live to you from the Hofstra campus in Hempstead, Hofstra University. My name is Margaret Marshall. I have been a speaker for about 30 years and um, I have two books out and I blog for the Huffington Post and right before I was asked to do this program I did a post on where your food preference comes from so that ties in really well to this program today. Um, I also teach continuing ed courses here at Hofstra University and that's why I'm here with you today and thrilled to be. These are just the pictures of my two books Body, Mind and Mouth and the Five Finger Food Guide. Now what's interesting is I am not 100 years old, I'm 58 years old, and I can hardly remember 58 years ago. So what I did is I, I introduced myself to a 99-year-old woman, and I interviewed her, and you're, I'm going to introduce you to her in a few minutes, and I'm going to tell you some of the things about her lifestyle, her traditions, and her American cuisine. We're going to talk about how American cuisine is, is tradition, is lifestyle, and family. And what's really interesting is, depending on what your heritage is, it, it kind of dictates what your cuisine is. So if you're Italian, you eat a certain type of cuisine. If you're Jewish, you eat another type of cuisine. If you're Irish like I am, there's another type of cuisine. So depending on uh, what your heritage is, that's basically where the, the American cuisine goes for you. What's interesting when I just did the research to write that blog that I told you about is that a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is so American to us and just we take it for granted. But what I found in my research is people who do not live in America think peanut butter and jelly is a disgusting thing to put together and they do not eat it. So it's really interesting when you think about the different food, what it means to you and what it means to others. So cuisine is all about traditions, family, and lifestyle and we'll talk about that. But before we start, I wanted to start with a story about Margaret Rudkin, her name is. Margaret Rudkin, R-U-D-K-I-N. And I don't know if you know who she is. It's someone I've never met, but I did some research into her. Now, I know you have probably heard of Pepperidge Farm. That's a very large corporation. The picture of the farm here is the original Pepperidge Farm, and that is where that whole food corporation started. The, the bread and the cookies and the crackers all started in a kitchen in this farm titled Pepperidge Farm and that is where the Rudkin family moved to in 1929 and that is where Margaret Rudkin started baking bread and she began baking bread. She was a mother of three boys and she began baking bread because one of her sons had severe asthma and allergies and could not eat the white bread that was so popular to the market. So she started baking this bread and she tried all different recipes and, and according to the research that I did on her, uh, most of her original bread nobody would eat. And then she came across this recipe that she used stone ground wheat bread. Her son loved it. And what they found was this bread did not affect his allergies or his asthma. So she went back to her doctor, her son's doctor, and told him about this bread that she was feeding her son. And as it turned out in the Connecticut area, this doctor prescribed this bread to his other patients that had the same conditions as her son. And she began baking bread for the doctor's patients. And that's how Pepperidge Farm started. Now, Pepperidge Farm, of course, has been around for a long time, and I'm sure you, like I, have eaten many of her products. But what she wanted to do, Margaret Rutkin had no business plan. She just had this bread that everybody seemed to love, and she needed to sell her bread for 25 cents. And the going rate for a loaf of white bread at that time was 10 cents. So she wanted to convince her local grocer to put the bread into his, what he sells to his customers, and he said to her, they will never buy your bread for 
25 cents when they can buy white bread for 10 cents. So what she did was she gave a free loaf of her bread to her grocer to try. And once he tried it, he realized that we can sell this bread for 25 cents. And I have a picture here of her going around with her local grocer to sell the bread. And isn't that what happens now in the grocery stores? At the end of the aisles, these food companies will give you a uh, free sample of their product to get you to buy it and to get you to like it. And that's exactly what Margaret Rutkin did. And although in all of the research it said she never had a business plan, that was her idea, to get people to taste her bread. Her, her baking really started in her kitchen. And the theme of this program today is that American cuisine starts in the kitchen. It starts in, in your family kitchen, it starts in my family kitchen. And it changes with generations and with technology. So Margaret Rudkin, from uh, 1937 to 1940, her business started to grow. Her husband was a businessman and also took the bread into Grand Central Station and started selling it there. So her client base got, her customer base got uh, larger. So she moved her business from her kitchen into the garage on her Pepperidge Farm, farm her land there. And then eventually in 1947, Pepperidge Farm moved to a new state-of-the-art bakery in Norwalk, Connecticut. And in, I think it was the end of the 1940s, Margaret Rudkin took a trip to Belgium. And that's when she tasted Belgium chocolate. And that's when she came up with the idea of putting, making cookies with chocolate on it. And so American cuisine changes through the generations and with technology. And although with the technology Margaret Rutkin had back then, changed the way her cuisine changed for her family and for her business. Today, I believe still the Campbell Company had bought out Pepperidge Farm and Campbell's owns it now, and, but they keep the, the factory in Connecticut so it's true to its roots. So like I, and that was the story of Pepperidge Farm and I find that so interesting because it all starts with a mother's love in her kitchen. So American cuisine, like I said, is the language of traditions, family, and lifestyle. And as I said before, depending on what your heritage is really kind of dictates what your cuisine is and what you enjoy eating and what you're used to eating. The cuisine does change with generations. When I did the research to write this blog for the Huffington Post, one of the things that I, I realized, and I probably already knew, but of course when you read research it kind of brings it home, that when immigrants came to this country, they came with the food that they liked to eat. But their, their children and their children's children wanted to be more Americanized. So their original food from their country began, began to get more Americanized with generations. And so that's what happens to that original food that came to this country with your immigrants. It also changed with technology because we have a different way of preparing food. We have a different way of storing food. I have two pictures of refrigerators here. And this, this first one was uh, a refrigerator that, um, I don't know if that was ice or electric at that time. I, it was the coil on the top. And then we have a refrigerator that you see in many homes now that, are, that can hold so many goodies. I don't have a refrigerator like that. I can't imagine having that much food in the house to have to store that. But many people do, and you do see that in many different homes. So the way of grocery shopping, I told you about this woman that I interviewed, and she had told me that when she was young, and when she, also when she was raising her family, and she raised her family in Freeport, Long Island, that you went to different stores to buy your food. If you wanted fish, she went to the Fresh Fish Market. And, and this picture of the fish here is from her photo albums that she went through with me. And she would go down there on the uh, docks of Freeport and choose fish that she wanted to, to feed her families. Also, she went to the butcher for her food, for her meat. and. Um, now we go into the food store. We still have butchers and we still have fish stores, but we have these large food stores, grocery stores, that sell everything that we need in one place. And the grocery stores just keep getting larger and larger and bringing more and more product 
into their grocery store so everything can be one-stop shopping for the busy person of today. Now, people shop online for their food and you sit at home and you sit in front of your computer and you order your food and then the grocery truck comes and, and brings the food to your house. And if you really think about that, that's what Margaret Rutkin from Pepperidge Farm, that's how she sold her, her bread. Originally, she went around with her grocer from door to door and sold the bread. But now people order their food online and everything is delivered right to their home. So the way we grocery shopped has also changed. So this is going to be the story of two American families and four generations. So let me introduce you to, to the people that I spoke to for this program today. This is Ruth, and Ruth was born in Brooklyn in 1915. And I had never known Ruth before. I happened to go meet her to talk to her about the way she ate through the years. And we sat out on her patio. This was in August, and we sat out on her patio. And she kind of just laid it all out to me. And the more she thought about it, the more she remembered. Now, Ruth is 99. She still lives at home. She lives with her 75-year-old daughter. And she still cooks, and she still bakes. And maybe very similar to Margaret Rutkin, she bakes for all of her neighbors. She knows what each neighbor likes to eat the most, and she'll bake with them in mind and then send it to their house. So she really loves to do this. And then this is Joan. And Joan was born in Queens in 1932. Now, Ruth and Joan are truly a generation apart. And I, in, in full disclosure, let me tell you that Joan is my mom. And I went to interview her after I interviewed Ruth because what I found so interesting is as I was interviewing Ruth, many of the things that she told me about her family and the way she fed her children were so similar to the stories that my mother has told me through the years and the stories and the way we lived. Ruth is of Irish-German descent, as is Joan. And what was really funny is when Ruth brought me, we sat on her patio, when she brought me into her home to show me pictures and, and um, share some more stories with me, I saw her dining room china cabinet with her good dishes in there. And they were the same exact dishes that my mother has in her dining room cabinet. So, so many similarities, including that, and they both got those dishes as a a wedding gift and they both served all their family meals on uh, family festivities their you know festive meals on these dishes throughout the years so we're going to talk a little bit about Ruth and Joan and although they're a generation apart there's many similarities similar stories and that's what I was saying here okay and then we have my generation and this is a picture of myself my husband and my two children and how American cuisine changed from Ruth's time to Joan's time to my time, Margaret's time, and then to my kids' time. And so Ruth, she was very nervous about speaking to me because she didn't think she would remember everything. But the more she remembered, the more she remembered. And I was able to ask her many questions. And she, she, at the end of our interview, she told me this was the most wonderful day she's had in weeks, just talking about her family and, and her loves. But both Joan and Ruth watched their mothers cook on this coal stove. And this is a picture that I found of a coal stove. It doesn't look like one that maybe that their mothers cooked on. It looks like it might be a reproduction, but that was the best I can do with that. And, and this is the type of stove that they watched their mothers cook on. Both Joan and Ruth said that their family meals consisted of meat, a potato, and vegetables. And so that was one thing they grew up with, and that was one thing that uh, they served their family. Now, both Joan and Ruth said that they made these big meals on Sunday, and Sunday meals were always eaten at the dining room table, and sometimes with their good dishes and sometimes without. And very often on Sundays, they would have family members uh, extended family come and dine with them and eat with them and so they would have these elaborate Sunday meals 
But during the week, I think it's my next one, no. During the week, they both said, both Ruth and Jones said that they did not make these big meals during the week. They made smaller meals that did not take so much time because they were busy with their children. Ruth had four children and Joan had five children. So Ruth remembers as a child in her mother's home they had an ice box and that the delivery man would come with ice and that's how they would keep their food fresh. And if you look at this ice box and you think about the refrigerators of today, you know, how much food could you fit in that ice box? So that's why everything was bought fresh and it was put into their ice box. One of the funny things that Ruth remembered as she was talking to me is the ice man that used to deliver the ice to her neighborhood. And as she was talking, she happened to have this memory of how she would love to follow the ice man because ice chips would fall off the ice truck. And that was a treat to her to, to uh, get these ice chips and suck on the ice chips. And very often she would follow this ice truck from one block to another in her neighborhood in Brooklyn when she was growing up and she would always get in trouble for leaving her block but to her it was worth it to get those ice chips. For my generation when I was growing up the kids followed the ice cream truck and uh, even now the ice cream trucks come around the neighborhood not as many people run out to the ice cream trucks now because everybody is in their homes with air conditioning and you don't always see it so you'll notice that the ice cream trucks have louder and louder noise. But when I was a kid, you followed the ice cream truck every day. You knew what time he was coming and you followed him from block to block. And in my home, I was one of five children, we each got a quarter to buy ice cream once a week off the ice cream man. Now you go to the ice cream man with your kids, it's probably $12 to buy your kids ice cream. So Joan remembers this refrigerator from her youth. Of course, it's not a picture of the one that she had in her home, but what she remembered was that there was a coil on the top and it was on legs. And for some reason, she remembered those legs. So as she was growing up in her home with her mother, this is how they kept their food, whereas Ruth was in the icebox. Her food was in the icebox. And then refrigerators got bigger. This one on the left is really a refrigerator that I remember from my grandmother's home. And it was mostly the bottom part was refrigerated. And there was this little box on top to put your frozen food in. And there was almost never any frozen food in there. And you would have to defrost it. And all of the uh, ice was up there. But then the refrigerators and the freezers got bigger. And they started to get colorful. And then you started to have matching appliances in your in your home. And I remember this, this green refrigerator. And at that time, you either had the avocado green, the harvest gold, or the copper brown. And, and all your appliances matched in your refrigerator because your kitchen went from being in this tiny little kitchen to more of a place for the family to gather. And homes started making larger ki kitchens. Now, this is the refrigerator of my youth. The, the, uh, Freezes got larger, the refrigerated section got larger, and you were able to keep more and more food in the house and keep it fresh. This is the refrigerator of my children's youth. And if you walk into someone's house where they have these side-by-side -side refrigerators and they have a family, the freezers are usually stacked, stocked because most people buy all their food now ahead of time and just keep it in the freezer to, uh, when they're, for when they're ready for it to prepare. And as you saw this picture before, some people have these kind of refrigerators and freezers with um, all kinds of goodies in them. Now, Ruth and Joan and myself, I remember the milkman coming. And he would deliver milk, and he would deliver fresh eggs to your house, and he would deliver um, bread. And there was a milk box that was always on the stoop. And the milkman would come, and he'd come early in the morning and just put those bottles of milk in, and then when the milk was empty, you'd put the empty bottles back and the milkman would take it away. And you didn't buy milk in a grocery store. I guess they maybe they sold it, I don't know. But you, most people in, at least where I lived in, what Ruth and Joan remember as they were raising their children, uh, you had that delivered. According to what Ruth said when she first started raising her family, 
everybody went to fresh fruit stands to buy your fruits and vegetables and you ate a lot of fresh vegetables. What I remember from growing up with my family, we really never had fresh fruit, in the, uh, fresh vegetables in the house. We had fruit, we never had fresh vegetables in the house and this was during maybe the 60s. You know, we had one car, every family had one car, and my father used the one car to get to work each day, and my mother had five children with no car, so all of us would go food shopping every Saturday morning, and we'd fill two carts, my mother held onto one cart, my father onto the other, and the five kids, and so you filled up two carts each Saturday, you came home, you put everything in your freezer and your refrigerator, and that's how you fed your family for the week. Food preparation has also changed with technology. And I don't know that so much the recipes and, and the recipes that were handed down through generations has changed, but the way we prepare food has changed. These are the stoves that, this stove on the left here is the stove that my mother remembers in her house with her family of origin. Again, for some reason she remembered the legs on the stove. But another thing she remembered with the stove is that in the apartment that she lived in there was no heat. So everyone gathered in the kitchen and they would turn on the stove to cook and that's where you would have heat. So her mother would make oatmeal or something hot in the morning and warm them up before they went to school. And then the gas stoves came out. And then this stove on the right is really the stove similar to what I remember of my childhood. And I remember my mom, Joan, she would feed the five of us and eat with us and then my dad would come in from work around 7 or 7.30 and she would have a pot of boiling water on the stove with his plate on top of the, bo the boiling water, on top of the pot, covered with tin foil. And that is how she kept his meal warm for when he got home. And then we had the electric stove, which is what I have today. But then microwaves came in. And that changed really the way we, we prepared food, the way we, we bought our food. And then what you see now, as microwaves originally were, came, when they came out, they were on countertops, and you know, not everybody had one, and everyone, I remember that in my time, maybe in, I don't know, the 70s or the early 80s when they came out, and everyone talked about getting a microwave, when well, now they're so commonplace that they're built into your kitchen, and so usually when you, when you buy a home or you redesign your kitchen, there's always a place to have your microwave uh, put into it, and people cook in their microwave, they don't only heat food up in their microwave, they cook in their microwave, and there's all kinds of recipes that are just for microwave cooking. But what microwaves did was it changed again the things we bought in the grocery store. And more and more food was sold to be, to be heated up in your microwave, already prepared food. Now I remember in my childhood, eating TV dinners, they were called, and, and very rarely, but they were like a real treat if we had a TV dinner. And there were little compartments in tinfoil with your meat and a side dish and a dessert. Um, but then all of a sudden, all of these prepared frozen foods came on the market. And you can buy anything now prepa prepared and frozen, and you take it home and you put it in your large freezers and you stick them in your microwave and they're ready at any time your food. So uh, whether you like that or not, that's the way many people buy their food now. What happened in the 30s is King Cullen was our first grocery store. And as I write here, it's recognized at the Smithsonian Institute as America's first grocery store. And that started here on Long Island. And this man, Mr. Cullen, and his name is really spelled C-U-L-L-E-N, but because he wanted to name his store King Cullen for the business, he changed it to K. And I think it was the A&P he worked for. I could be wrong on that, but I think it was the A&P. And he went to his company and he said, I have this great idea that we build a big grocery store where all of the food can be served in one place. People can come to the store because now more and more people had cars and in their cars they could put more food into their cars and their refrigerators had gotten larger. 
So now they can put more food into their cars, they could shop with a larger cart and walk up and down aisles and have no delivery and cash only sales and people will come to us. And the company that he worked for didn't like the idea. So he decided to open up his own store. And that's when King Cullen was, was founded in 1930. And now we have larger and larger stores. And you, this, the shopping carts have gotten so large because what they're hoping is that if your cart is not full, you don't think you've finished your grocery shopping. So the carts have gotten big, the aisles have gotten big. The studies show that the more steps you take in a grocery store, the more food you will buy. So people shopping for their families just keep, if the carts are big and the aisles are long and they're big, they'll just keep buying larger quantities of food. And then came the box stores like Costco and like BJ's and now people are buying these huge huge quantities of food and not only do they keep them now in your refrigerator now people have food stocked in their their pantries and I, I know many of my clients have food stocked in their garages and on sh they put shelves in the garage just to stock these big boxes of food that they keep for their family and uh, the studies about the grocery store is that people are just laying down money and buying all this food and from the people that I talk to, they never even finish the food that they buy. When I spoke to Ruth about coffee, she said in her lifetime as her young girl and when she first started her family, there was only percolators and coffee was made on a stove top in your kitchen and that was the only place you had coffee. And then Sanka came out and then started the whole instant coffee craze and people would just Hot, boiling hot water in their teapots and making instant coffee because it was quicker and easier than the percolator. And then the drip coffee came out. And I can remember that in my lifetime. I don't know, maybe in the late 70s, 80s, around there, the drip coffee maker came out. And I can remember people saying, can't be good if it's that kind of coffee's being made that way. But it really took off and everybody had a drip coffee maker in their house. And now we have the pods where you, your coffee maker stores its own water, you just put your cup in there and one little pod, you put it in there and uh, it just drips into your cup and in minutes you have a cup of coffee. But what many people do now, many busy people, they go out and buy coffee. Many people don't even, no longer make coffee in their home, they just go to their local convenience store and buy coffee. So we've gone from percolators in Ruth's childhood to coffee at your local convenience store now. Both Ruth and Joan remember making three meals a day for their families, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The difference is when Ruth's children were young, her children came home from school each day. And so they would have their lunchtime back in their home and Ruth would make them, she said, most often sandwiches. But in Joan's uh, when she was raising her children, she packed a lunch every day and put it in this, this paper bag and her children went off to lunch every day with the paper bag. Now Ruth said that she made sandwiches each day for her children and in Joan's paper bag I remember always having a sandwich, a piece of fruit and cookies. And our sandwich was always either peanut butter and jelly or bologna, that's what I remember. But I asked Ruth what her children like to snack on. And her snacks, she said for her children, were pretzels. And on her kitchen counter, she had four canisters. One held coffee, one held flour, one held sugar, and one held pretzels for her children. And what I saw on the History Channel just recently, and I thought it was so interesting, if you take your hands and put them together like this, so if you want to just do that for a moment, put your hands together and then look at what your hand looks like. The, the knotted pretzels were designed after that look. They were designed after a praying hand. You know the, the knotted pretzels they call it? And I also saw on the History Channel because our snacks were mostly cookies growing up. But I also saw on the History Channel of how potato chips started. A woman was in a restaurant 
and she ordered French fries, and this was in the 19 teens, and she ordered French fries, and she returned her French, French fries to the kitchen because they were too thick, and she wasn't enjoying them. So what they did in the kitchen of the restaurant was slice them real thin, recook them, and send them back out. And other people in the restaurant that day started ordering what she had on her plate. And so they called them potato chips. So the original potato chips were served warm. And then, of course, a food company uh, liked that idea, and then they started manufacturing them, and that's how we have today's potato chips. Now today we have new guidelines for the school lunch programs and they're trying to get healthier and healthier with the kids. I know when I was a kid we each had one day a week where we were allowed to purchase a, a school lunch. We took the menu and chose one day a week, but nowadays more and more children are eating the school lunches and uh, it was really Michelle Obama's push to get the school lunches healthier. I remember having milk every day with lunch, but I, over the years they've served soda and, and sugary fruit drinks and donuts and things like that. And so we want to take that away from the children. So there's all kinds of guidelines now for school lunch programs to make our children healthier. So they've really come a long way with that. Um, I said this before, Ruth and Joan, Joan both remember preparing dinner each night for their family. What, my, what Joan said, uh, which goes back to traditions, is that she never had, I told you she was Irish German descent, she never had spaghetti until she got married. They never had spaghetti in her house. And I can remember as a child on Friday evenings when you did not eat meat during, when you did not eat meat on Fridays at all, we would have spaghetti. And I never knew she never had that as a child. So they both said, both Ruth and Joan said that there was very little eating out, if any, during their childhood. Ruth said that when she had her four children, sometimes on a very hot summer day, her and her husband would take the four children to the piers on, uh, in Freeport just to get some fresh air and they would all order sandwiches out and that was their eating out. I remember eating out so rarely as a child. Uh, but now we have all of these fast food restaurants and there are so many different types of restaurants. And if you drive down any town in any part of America, you see scenes like this. You see restaurant, fast food restaurant after fast food restaurant. They have all popped up through the years. And many families now eat out during the weekend, even on weekends in those restaurants. But I will tell you, Raising my family, raising my children, I know we have dined out in restaurants much more than I did as a child. And according to my mother Joan and Ruth, they never dined out in a restaurant at all. And in fact, I asked Ruth if she ever heard of a chef during her, her young, younger years. And because now, I mean, we have the Food Channel, we have, you know, from Julia Child to Rachel Ray. I mean, chefs are a big thing. And her comment was, she thought about it for a few minutes, honestly, and then she said, I think the White House had a chef. So that was not a big thing like it is now. So the language of cuisine changes with generations and technology. And as we went through this, um, you saw, and, and in your own lifetime you've seen, how the way we prepare food, the way we keep food, the way we serve food, and the way we eat food has changed. And I bet if you think back to your youth and then your years of raising your family as I do, I eat very differently now than I did in my childhood, than now, and the way food is prepared and the food that we buy in the grocery stores are very different. Um, and everything changes, but yet so much has stayed the same. Because when I make a, a meal for my family when we're all together or when I have company coming, um, I still have that roast, that meat, the vegetables, and the potatoes. And everything starts in the kitchen. Everything started in the kitchen. And when you look at homes that were built years ago, like if I can remember visiting my grandmother's house 
in the 60s. I was born in the late 50s, so in the 60s, her kitchen was very tiny, her stove was very tiny, and her refrigerator and kitchen table, very tiny in this tiny little room. But now homes, the kitchen is the center of the home, and everyone gathers in the kitchen because food matters, and food is what brings the families together. And the kitchen remains today the center of the house, and cuisine is how the families come together. So I, need, I would like you to just think about that for a moment and think about how the food throughout your generation has changed. Think about how our, our food companies started. They started somewhere in someone's kitchen, most of them. And if it wasn't in a kitchen in a home, it was a, in a kitchen in a factory. And everything goes back to the food that we eat. Our happiness, our health, our connections all go back to the food that we eat. And what I also learned when I wrote that Huffington Post blog, and I think I titled it, Where Does Your Food Preference Come From? If you're with someone of a different background than you and they eat different food than you, their food is their language. And if you can join in their cuisine with them, a little different, it's all American, if we're here, but a little different, they understand and accept you a lot quicker than if you say, oh no, I don't eat that. So think back to all of your years because doing this program certainly had me thinking back to my years. Lots of good memories of a lot of great people and um, meeting Ruth was certainly a joy and compare, knowing that she and my mother Joan were so similar so similar in the things, the way they served their family food and the way they prepared food. So I hope you enjoyed this today. I hope you saw some pictures and some memories of things from your past as I did from mine. I hope that you think about it as the day goes on. And like Ruth, when she said to me at the end of our interview, when she said, I had so much fun telling you about the way I ate as a child, the way I fed my family, and how I now cook my own meals and bake for my neighbors. So I would, if, if, as the day goes on, if you tell your friends and you compare stories about your cuisine growing up and, and raising your families and now, you will just have a great time doing it because we had a great time together putting this program together for you. And thanks for being with us today. So Armonk, are there any questions or comments this morning? One resident wants to know how important tradition is. I think that's very different in each family. I think traditions, um, traditions can get started at any time. And I know for me, traditions are not only food, but traditions are maybe the people that you're with or the holidays that you celebrate or uh, the, the things that you get together with. I know for me, traditions are real important. And I would imagine in each family, different traditions bring up different memories. And the traditions are going to be as important as the memory that they conjure up. So that would be my answer to how important are traditions. But traditions can always be changed. That's the beauty of traditions. If they don't work for you, you know, change it and find a new tradition. I think that's the beauty of tradition. East Meadow, do you have any questions today? Yes, a resident wanted to know your thoughts on Fort and Horn and Hardick. Yes, in fact, I was going to look into that for this program as well. Horn and Hardick, that is the uh, automat in the city. Are we talking about the same thing? I was going to look into that program today, for, for this today. And um, 
I knew I only had 45 minutes and I really enjoyed the, the story of Pepperidge Farm, but I can remember going to Horn and Hardick in the city and opening up the little, you know, choosing which sandwich I wanted. I would go in with my dad and choosing which sandwich I wanted and opening up the little door there, it was a clear door if I remember correctly, and taking out a sandwich. And that was, you know, really one of the originals. Uh, quick food and we would go there for lunch at times so I do remember that and I'm wondering if your resident that is asking about this if that's if that's one of her memories going to Horn and Hardick. East Northport any questions this morning? Well we are all sitting here um, agreeing with all of the things that you're saying and, and, and making connections and one of the things personally that uh, we'll be discussing after the seminar is how the art of conversation has changed since we no longer sit often at the tables together. I know uh, personally some people here that work here say that their husbands, including mine, eat standing up at the counter sometimes on the way to work. So would you consider writing a book based on the sociology or psychology or blog on how that has changed around the way of cuisine? Well, that that is a great question and a great con comment and <clears throat> excuse me and quite honestly what I deal with with my clients very often is the the idea of sitting down every time you eat very often when you're standing and eating it's very mindless eating and you're not really enjoying what you're eating you're just putting it in there and moving on to your next thing so I, I think the conversation you know when I did this program and we talked about eating in the dining room how many people do that anymore with their families that on Sunday they set a time aside to have a family meal with conversation? And I think that's so important. And I know when I was raising my children, we didn't have cell phones then, but when we had a family meal together, which was not, of course, every day, you know, schedules didn't allow that, but at least once or twice a week I really pressed on that. When we had a family meal to together, nobody answered the phone, even if it rang, and there was no television on so that we could talk. And now, uh, people I, I find from my clients, they sit with their phone or their devices and they're texting and uh, playing games. And even if you go into a restaurant, you see families, the mother and father might be talking, but the kids are all there on devices, not even paying attention. So I think that's a great topic of how the conversation over a dinner table has changed. Uh, and I hope you do have a great discussion over that because that's a really good point. Lindbergh, any questions for me this morning? Do you think that the prepared foods that we have today in the supermarket is a big impact on today's health? Oh boy, that is my topic exactly. Yes. To shorten that question, yes. And, and I know all the statistics and I know all the facts and I can tell you when we started coming out, when America started coming out with fat-free products and sugar-free products, we got heavier. We got heavier because we eat too much of it. It was marketed to us as good food and um, it's really not the healthiest food for you. And what I'm finding now is that I know I talked about how Ruth went to and bought all fresh food for her family as she was raising them. More and more grocery stores are, are starting that now. Now we have Whole Foods and we have Fairway where you can go in and buy all these fresh foods and not so many processed foods. So absolutely yes, the less processed foods you eat, the healthier you will be. Massapequa, any questions for me this morning? Okay, we have one question. If you take into consideration the economy level of different generations, is food more expensive now than it was before? Hmm, that's a tough question because incomes are so different. And um, in, in whatever year we're in, we have people who make less money and people who make more money. So I would say that depending on where your econ where your income is, that's the way you need to feed your family. Um, I know for me, there were weeks when I fed my family and, you know, I, I could get filet mignon and there were weeks where we had spaghetti and tomato sauce. So depending on what else needed to be paid. So I do think that the economy of the family makes a difference on the way you eat. What I also think is everyone 
has this myth that it is more expensive to eat healthier food, and that's really a myth. So um, I wish we could educate more people on how to eat healthy on a stricter budget, and um, that's one thing that I, I, I like to do. Sayville, any questions this morning? With the majority of families having both parents working, do you think that has any effect on the cuisine or the meals that they're eating? I absolutely um, believe that it does, and I think that's a very hard thing for a family to do if they have both parents working. You know, in order to cook a home-cooked meal, you need to be home. So with many of my clients, we try and work ways around um, how to maybe share the cooking or easier things to cook and to prepare for your family, or maybe prepare double batches so that you have dinner for another night, but it absolutely plays a part. You know, Ruth and Joan, both while they were raising their children, were stay-at-home moms for a very long time. They both went back to work at a certain time, but while they were making those three meals a day for their family, that, that was their job. That's what they were doing. So things are very different now, and, and it's, it's tough on a family to, to have a, a meal on the table every night. Thank you so much for being here today. It was my pleasure to be here with you today at Bristol Better You, live from the Hofstra campus. Again, my name is Margaret Marshall, and I wish you all a great cuisine and great conversations.